Today we've got a crazy story of revenge against a neighbor who would not stop littering. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, I got the revenge I wanted, but it still hurt. After this experience, I came to realize that certain people work to bring out the worst in you, and I mean the absolute worst. When the whole thing was over, I had to delete her number. Knowing that we would never have to meet again was the one thing that brought me peace, and if I'm being honest, I sometimes find myself thinking maybe I should have done more. I like to think that I wasn't this hurt in the beginning, and truth be told, I was not. My hurt began after I was painted as the bad guy in front of the rest of our friend group, and I chose to be the bad guy I had been painted to be. We were younger when we met, kind of carefree with not as much to worry about. The first time we met was in the room of one of our mutual friends, David. I knew David from high school, but they were in the same class for the pre-degree program we were undergoing to grant us admission into college. At first, that was all we were. I believed something was going on between her and David at some point due to how frequently I would run into her. From being acquainted with her based on her friendship with David, I came to know that she was also friends with some other girls I would taken a liking to in the pre-degree program. It was never that I chose specifically to be friends with Gabriella, it just kind of happened and I went with the flow of things. But, well, this friendship ended up being garbage. After our first pre-degree session was completed, I thought that would be the end of our communication and supposed friendship. However, we were offered college admission and we both chose to come for our respective degrees. As freshmen, we didn't stay together. We were both given school hostels, as was required by the school for new intakes. By the end of the first academic year, we chose to get an apartment away from the campus area simply because we were the only two friends of our group who had yet to have a plan on where to live in our second academic year. It wasn't rocket science to prefer to live with someone you're familiar with instead of pairing with a random person. It was sensible and practical and it was what we went for. We moved in by the start of the second year and began loving the roommate experience. Of course, there were minor issues we faced from time to time. It ranged from having multiple friends over who constituted a nuisance to our apartment to days she would leave the kitchen untidy and proceed to wash the single plate she wanted to use just to prevent her from doing the dishes. But all of this was trivial. They weren't things that couldn't get an easy fix. Most of the time, I had to be the one to make the compromises, but I didn't mind. Amidst it all, there were fun times too. By the end of our second year, it was confirmed that my younger sister Sophie would be joining me in school for her course of study. The math was kind of simple. She was going to have to stay with me. It genuinely made no sense for her to have to rent another apartment with a stranger since she didn't go through the pre-degree route I took to get into the college. Coincidentally, this was Gabriella's third year, and third year students were expected to go for internship training for half of the academic year. This meant that I and my younger sister would have the room to ourselves in a couple of months once she went for IT. I spoke to my sister and she was pretty cool with it, even though she detested living without her privacy. The months Gabriella stayed in the room with me and Sophie went by quickly. The room was ours, but Gabriella's properties were still in the apartment pending the time that she would be done with her IT and would resume for the final year of her study. However, as I returned for my fourth year alongside Sophie, who resumed for her second year, there was a subtle shift in the temperament of the apartment. There was this unspoken tension in the air between the three of us. It was more like the tension was between Sophie and me as one group and Gabriella as the second group. I believe that the tension started from unexpressed emotions as to why Gabriella did not move out of the room upon the resumption of the fourth academic year. She resumed school the way she left, like there was no understanding that she would not have a place in the room when she came back from IT. I tried to live with it and so did Sophie. For months neither of us said anything. We were in part waiting to see what Gabriella's actions would be, especially concerning the rent that had been paid for a year in her absence. She said nothing while actively living in an apartment that she did not pay a dime for. Where things started to go south was when we ran out of food and had to share the bill for getting more. At first, I suggested to Sophie that we get things we need by ourselves, but she thought that it would end in Gabriella living off our food again. So she came up with the idea to combine the budget and make it into three equal parts for the three of us. The plan was simple, get the money, then combine resources to purchase the needed food. Three days after I told Gabriella of the arrangement, I realized that she packed up the rest of the stuff she brought from home and kept it in her private locker. 
It seemed really weird at first, given that that had never happened before. And when I confronted her about why, she acted like I was overreacting. I called Sophie's attention to what I noticed and she suggested that we get our food and begin to cook separately. But what was more puzzling was the fact that she could actually confront me about why I and Sophie have been cooking without her in mind. One evening, I came back home after a hectic day of impromptu class assessments and found my sister sitting with Gabriella at the entrance of the room. On a regular day, two years before that, I wouldn't have found anything suspicious in the interaction. But with the way things were, I knew something was off. So I butted into the discussion. The problem at this point was that my sister brought people over to the apartment without informing her first. She argued that she had a right to know if people would be within earshot of her being loud because they were celebrating a friend's birthday. Seeing it as an avenue to bring up issues that were plaguing her, she turned to me and spoke about the cooking arrangement. While I acknowledged the validity of her concerns, since I didn't tell her we were done cooking together, the discussion took an unexpected turn. It transformed from a shared problem to a one-sided blame game. Her tone outright changed from sounding like she wanted the issue resolved to sounding like she just wanted to keep pointing accusing fingers at me. She failed to see why she should not have been living under our roof without payment, and she could not understand what was wrong with packing what was left of her groceries the minute I asked that we divide the expenses amongst ourselves. The back and forth took a while, but no conclusion was reached, and things carried on the same way they had for three weeks. The next day, I carried on like nothing had happened and went about my day. It was a Saturday. Suddenly, I got a message from one of our mutual friends that she was coming over to our apartment, and I didn't think anything of it. It was just a normal, harmless friendship visitation. However, I was surprised to see that three of our mutual friends came around, not just one. Their appearance was disguised like a coincidence, but I saw through their facade. It became extremely evident when they began to ask questions about being angry at Gabriella. It was then that I realized that she had informed them of what had gone down in the house, but that wasn't all she did. Not really. While telling her story to them, she made her truth a compilation of half-truths and outright fabrications of events surrounding our living arrangements. In her attempt to garner sympathy and support, she painted a picture that portrayed me as the sole antagonist in the drama. These mutual friends decided to see me as the bad guy in the picture, blaming me, and for a minute I wondered if truly everything was my fault. The realization of this betrayal weighed heavily on me. It wasn't just a fracture in my friendship with Gabriella, it was a rupture that extended to the very fabric of our social connections. Nothing was the way it used to be after that attack they launched on me. I reached a breaking point, and the only thing I wanted in return was to get a pound of flesh. I wanted to draw blood. Of course, not literally. I just wanted Gabriella to experience the hurt and betrayal that she made me feel. I knew the housing issue was a good way to strike, so I took a shot at it. I had to first confront her before kicking my plan into motion. That confrontation was cringeworthy and silly at the same time. There was a part of me that felt like I was ruining a good thing and that I could just keep up with her underlying manipulation. But to be honest, there was another part that felt she deserved way more than the calm outlook I took to confront her. It was this part of me that wanted payback. Payback in a way that would seem justified for my actions. That night, I told her she had to leave. I went in to meet her alongside Sophie and the ultimatum was clear. She had two days to pack her belongings and leave. I thought that telling her to pack up her things was a way to hurt her for turning my friends against me and manipulating me, and my sister was letting her know just how serious I was about being pissed. Yet as the sun rose on the morning of the third day, Gabriella remained silent and unmoved from the apartment. At that moment, I was upset on two grounds. The first was that she had the guts to stay after everything, and also because she probably didn't expect me to make good on my threat to kick her out after two days. So I did what she was not expecting. I went out the morning of the third day and came back with new locks. After installing them, I informed her that I was traveling for three days and she would not be able to leave the house as I had changed the locks. It was at this point that she knew I was pretty serious. She asked that I give her till the end of the morning to be out of my hair. After she left, I made sure to delete her number after I blocked her on every social media site I had her on. I didn't want to have a reminder of how people could bleed you dry and still make you out to be a bad person in the long run. 
I guess my question in this situation is, how do you choose friends more carefully in the future? You know, ones that aren't going to hear one thing and just blindly follow it. I mean, I gotta give her credit, it was crafty to try to craft this narrative and get multiple people kind of swooping in to try to pressure OP, but like, at the same time, when OP tries to share their perspective, are they not expecting these people who already just blindly heard one thing and followed it, aren't going to also hear another thing from OP and blindly follow that? I doubt Gabriella's Kool-Aid was that strong. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, it would be amazing if you liked this video or left a review if you're listening to my podcast. That said, our next story is, I got my abusive boss arrested. I've never really put much thought into the concept of abuse. Concept? Is that even the right word? I mean, I've experienced being catcalled, being leered at and all, but I'm sure that's like every other woman but I never thought that one day I might be the victim of sexual harassment. It all happened at the firm I worked with when I was done with college. I'd always wanted to get started on my career as soon as possible and due to my good grades, I received a lot of great offers straight out of college, but most of them were internship roles. And like I said, I wanted to start earning the big bucks as soon as possible. This was why I jumped at the offer I got with a firm who were willing to employ me directly. I was very excited about this new job because the prospect seemed great and because my older brother had always said that there was no way I would do well because I partied throughout my entire college years. There was no way I could do well in academics to the point that I'd get employed. I wanted to show him how wrong he was. After accepting the offer, I started working immediately. My role required me to work closely with the department's head, Mr. T. I was supposed to assist him, basically, and even travel with him for business meetings and conferences if need be. On the first day, I was shown around by someone in my department, let's call her H. She was the office assistant of the department and one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. By the time she was done giving me the tour, she hugged me and said something that really bothered me. She said, and I quote, I hope you last longer than the other one. You can't hear something like that and not want to know what she's talking about, right? So I went to take my seat in my assigned workspace. There, I asked the lady who was working beside me, we'll call this one L, about who I replaced. She said that another girl used to work here, but she quit. I didn't understand why someone would quit a job like this when I thought that all the prospects were perfect. I'm not even joking, I could already see myself working there for the next 20 years of my life. When I asked the details of the previous girl quitting, Elle wasn't very keen on speaking, so I ended the conversation there. That evening, when I was done with work, my new co-workers invited me to this bar very close to our firm. They said it was their ritual for every new worker who was brought into the department. Obviously, I agreed, and we went. After a few shots of vodka and beer, I asked about the girl who worked my role before me. My co-workers were a bit more loose-lipped doing shots quite a lot of shots, I have to say. They told me that she filed a sexual harassment claim against the head of the department, Mr. T. An investigation was carried out and it was discovered that she was lying, so she quit her job and left. It was quite a bizarre story, really. It didn't add up and I couldn't stop thinking about it even as I got home. I've heard about a lot of women lying about the fact that they were harassed and I've even seen instances where the supposed harasser did time for a crime he knew nothing about. On the other hand, if a superior was harassing his or her subordinate, it'll be very easy to shut her up by threatening them. I didn't know why at the time, but this story bothered me, and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. I knew I should be able to come up with a narrative based on the personality of Mr. T. I didn't meet him the previous day because he was out of town for a business meeting. He was supposed to be back sometime during the week. He came back on Thursday, and surprisingly, everyone celebrated his return to work. I mean, they were genuinely happy to see him. They cheered and clapped as he distributed hugs to everyone. It was as though I was witnessing the return of a war hero. I immediately saw why though. Mr. T was nice and warm. He must be in his early 50s, but he was very energetic. When I was introduced to him as the new replacement for the previous girl, he greeted me with so much warmth and respect that I decided that the previous girl actually made the entire harassment thing up. This kind and gentle man couldn't possibly be able to do something as terrible as that. The next thing that I noticed was that he was very close with the top floor executives. They shared a relationship that none of the other heads of departments shared. 
I asked one of my co-workers about this, and he told me that Mr. T and the CEO were related. They were cousins, and very close ones to be exact. I noticed something weird though. As I said, everyone in the department was happy to see Mr. T. Everyone but H. She didn't come to say hi to him like everyone else. When everyone had settled back to their posts, I asked her why. She didn't tell me anything, no matter how much I asked again and again. Eventually, I decided to give up. Less than two weeks after Mr. T got back, we had a joint task to work on. The company was meeting prospective clients, and it was up to us to reel them in. Mr. T had the charm and charisma, while I brought the facts and offers. The meeting went well, the clients were already swinging our way, so it didn't take much to convince them to bring their business to our firm. But after the deal was done, Mr. T decided to open another bottle of champagne with the clients to celebrate the new business. Another few hours passed and it was finally time to leave. Mr. T was drunk, but luckily he had a driver on standby. I wanted to get a cab, but he convinced me to ride with him. He said he'd have his driver take me home. He was pretty insistent, so I agreed. That was my mistake. The inside of the car was demarcated in a way that the driver couldn't see what was going on at the back. Mr. T was talking to me about something I couldn't really understand because he was slurring his words. Eventually, the car hit a speed bump and his head slid on my shoulder. He made a move to straighten himself and it made me really uncomfortable. I remembered that he was drunk, so I decided not to say anything. But then, he moved even closer and before I knew it, his palm found its way to my thigh. He tried to lean even closer and that was when I reacted. I pulled his hand off of me and shifted away from him till I was perched at the edge of the seat. The rest of the ride was silent and awkward and I couldn't wait to get home. When I was in the safety of my bedroom, I was finally able to think clearly. Drunk or not, Mr. T had harassed me in that car. That meant that there was a huge chance that the lady before me was telling the truth. I decided not to jump to conclusions till the next day. I was going to talk to him about it and see what he says. When he got to work, I went to his office to talk about the car ride. To my uttermost shock, he denied having any memory of anything happening between me and him. He said he offered me a ride home and he took me home. When I tried to convince him that he was drunk and that he touched me inappropriately, he got mad and told me to leave his office. I was dumbfounded. I didn't know how to react to that. I couldn't even work well because I couldn't stop thinking about it. By lunch break, everyone had left the office for the break room. That was when H approached me and asked what was going on. I confided in her and told her what had happened the previous night. As I narrated the story, H looked on. She didn't even look surprised for a split second. When I was done, she said, I knew he was going to do it to you too. It was just a matter of when. She told me that he'd also harassed her countless times. I was shocked. I asked her why she didn't do anything about it, and she said there was nothing she could do because the CEO and other executives were always protecting him. When the other girl reported his actions to the disciplinary panel, she was branded as a liar because she didn't have any tangible evidence. She couldn't sue because of the same reason, and also because everyone in the department loved him, and they'd surely testify for him. She also said that the previous girl didn't quit of her own volition. She was forced to by the executives after they threatened that they'd fire her and they'd make sure she didn't get another job anywhere. H said it had been happening for as long as she'd been working with the firm, which was over three years. I wasn't going to work in an environment where the boss was a disgusting perv who preyed on helpless girls. Even if I wasn't going to work in the company anymore, I wanted to make sure he didn't do it to anyone else. It took a lot to convince H to help me in my plan. It was only when I promised not to call her name if things went south that she agreed. She was sure that the car ride was only the first time and that it will happen again, so I should prepare myself. That was exactly what I needed. We needed cementing evidence to ensure that he didn't escape justice. So I bought a spy camera, the kind they put in a teddy bear's eyes. I didn't know when I was going to use it, but I had to have it just in case. Then one day, Mr. T was tasked with meeting a client in an event in a different state. It was a two-day event, so we needed to book a hotel for a night. I wanted to handle that, but Mr. T said he would do it, so I let him. But when we got there, we discovered that he'd only reserved one room, and all the other rooms were fully booked. 
He called it an error on his part and that he'd let me have the bed, but I knew what it was, so I prepared myself. In the restroom, I used a pin to cut out a tiny hole in my bag and stuck the camera in. When Mr. T went to take a shower, I positioned my bag in a strategic position and it could see the entire room. When he got back, he made a show of sleeping on the couch, but after 20 minutes he came to the bed saying the couch was uncomfortable. After another 30 minutes, he started to make a move on me. I tried to tell him off, but he only got bolder touching me and trying to kiss me. Eventually, I leapt off the bed, grabbed my bag and stuff, and left the room. I had to get another hotel to sleep in, but I didn't care. I got the evidence of his harassment, and I took it directly to the cops. After all the appropriate questioning and paperwork, he was arrested and charged with attempted R-word. H and I testified against him, and with our evidence, he was found guilty. He's still serving time as we speak. I'm willing to bet OP probably wouldn't have wanted to mention for everybody else's sake, but considering this guy is still doing time, well, I mean, I don't know how long it's been, but I'm willing to bet that there was more than just OP and H speaking out against him. It's great when a monster like this finally gets put under scrutiny because so many people who kind of felt like they just had to live with this, all of a sudden have a platform to come out of the woodworks and try to get this guy held accountable for what they did. Our next story is, Bogan is as Bogan does. My smoking neighbor won't quit it on my driveway. My closet quitting neighbor who smokes. My street is usually quiet. We mostly all own our houses except for the odd one in each street that's a rental. Due to the area improving, we don't have the usual trouble that used to occur. But there are those moments that make things annoying and unpleasant, and the new renter directly across the road from me became one of those unpleasant things that needed to be weeded out. My house is on a slight decline, living on the low side of the street, so my driveway slopes down to my garage, and from the other side, if you sat down there, you're invisible to the prying eyes of the houses on the opposite side. So recently, I started finding cigarette butts around where I place my bins. No biggie, I just started tossing them into it and pondered, who the freak had been smoking here? Few days go by, and if I was not at work, and on a day off cleaning in the garage, sometimes I would notice my neighbor from across the street pop up on the top end of my driveway, then turn about. This struck me as a little odd. This kept up, and I just kept putting the stray butts in the bin, but it annoyed me. Why smoke here and flick them to the bin? It's less than two meters from the bin, so I had a chat with the wife. Had she noticed anyone doing this? Despite the obvious disturbed look she gave me, she had no clue. Knew it wasn't anyone here in my house. It's now just the two of us and eight cats and two dogs. They lack opposable thumbs to operate a lighter. So option B, set up a wireless camera with motion detection and set up the app on my phone to alert me. This was possibly one of the better ideas for the day man flew that day. Upon looking at most security cameras that were available, we settled on Eufy. Nice little buggers easy to set up, battery operated and last for ages, waterproof to boot. So I hid that little freaker under the roof pointing at the gap in the shed door and it had just enough room to peek at the driveway and bins. Think corner of a square hole with a round peg in it, nice big gap to see through. It didn't take long to find where the butts were coming from. The next bloody day he got caught, bras in his freak, the butt hat swaggers down my driveway, puts his butt in park on it, and lights one up. Less than two freaking meters from the bins! He smokes that ciggy dry and flicks it at my bins and wanders back to his nest. That brazen freaking littering expletive bag. Had to do something, but first I have to give him a chance. So the next roster day I had off, I synced it with his smoking habit and I waited for the ping from the app. Sure enough, there he was on rinse and repeat mode. Not wanting to risk startling him and having him scatter like the cockroach he was, I went out the back door and around the side of the house and out towards the front. As I approached, he had just finished up, flicked the butt at the bins and stood up. As he turned around to find me, the proverbial deer in headlights as he spotted me does not quite cover it. What felt like an eternity after he had just processed he got busted, what the freak you want escaped his lips. I just asked, mate, if you're going to do that, at least smother the butt and put it in the bin. All this bogan trash could reply with was, you don't own this part of the strip, council does, and you can't make me do crap. Thinking he's won the Olympic gold medal for being an expletive, 
he shoves past me, walks across the road and returns to his nest. No freaker, no medal for you. Game freaking on. So that camera, by Eufy. It supports dumping events to a NAS network address storage. Files get time and date stamped. Every time this jerk went out to smoke, it secretly took his photo, smoking and flicking the butt at the bin. All I had to do was buy bulk Ziploc bags and just dump the butts in them and write the time and date on them. If they wanted evidence, so be it, they can have it. This is what I did for a year. Collect his butts, write the time and date on the bag, and show it to the camera for authenticity and leave. So many butts. I wanted this, he wanted this, who was I to deny him? 365 days in a year, could I make it that far? The box was just about full of butts and bags and it's only day 345. It's so close, but the stench, I had to do it. So I boiled the kettle and made a thermos of coffee. If I have to get up during the reporting of this, it's to pee. And I'm not going to do the neckbeard bottle pee. That's just gross. So I sorted through the photos on the NAS drive and started prepping for the reporting. Report a tosser. Really in website branding. Used it a couple of times before. And it took a few minutes to make a post last time. So I logged in and started. Each one by one of 345, but it had to be done. One after one after one, the cycle repeated. 200 to go. 100 to go. 50 on the home stretch now. Was that enough? Freak no, the image of his Olympic gold medal had to be reduced to ashes. He wasn't going to get away with this. Carpal tunnel be dinged. It had to be done. Finally, after the last 50 were done, I felt euphoric, exhausted, and darn proud of myself. So I went to crash in bed. Or so I thought. Ping. What the freak? My phone just got an email. Ping. Again. Ping. Freak me, is a Reddit post going viral? Ping. Oh, it's an email. From report a tosser confirming the reports. Each one individually like I did. Ping. Is this automated or is some poor human? Sorry, whomever that was. The only casualty in this strike was meant to be my neighbor. Ping. For freak's sake. Coming from Android, that little do not disturb switch on an iPhone is awesome. It took a few days, but one day I got the hint something was going down. First, he got a letterbox stuffed with mail. That's weird. The next day was some angry noises coming from the house, like real loud. It sounded like a huge blow up between him and his missus. Thankfully, someone who lived next to him called the police. That shut them up for a bit. And then the notice. What the freak did I do? Oh, they're sending a request for the box of butts. Okay, post them off and be done with it. The final day, I thought I was having a stroke. This can't be real. I've never seen him in a freaking suit. Oh yeah, legal. They wanted the butts. He took the go to court option. Now on the website, it specified $250 for an individual per offense. But I had no clue to, well, 345 offenses. Well, let's just say he left for the day and did not return. But eventually a moving truck turned up and out came the internals of the house. TV, fridge, sofa, bed, angry looking woman, crying kids. Okay, I feel a little bad for them, but considering who spawned them, not so much an ounce of regret. Eventually I found out that he took a plea for community service and a whopping fine over jail time, upon which his wife left him. So does, for better or worse, not mean anything, but considering what she had, it was probably for the better, and any interaction I had with her was far better than her gold medalist, but that was all I could gather. He's having to burn both ends of the candle for both the fine, community service, and child support. Godspeed, my rotten bogan. Godspeed and good riddance, you expletive. OP was being so petty and it blew up so badly for this guy. This guy should have known how amazing OP was as a neighbor when they saw you continuously smoking and littering on their property and their only reaction was, hey, I mean, if you're gonna do that, just toss it in the bin. Why upset a neighbor that's that cool enough to even, like, look past that? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.